Welcome to a Halloween edition of Monster Mondays, a series where I draw a D&D monster and I talk about their lore, their history in the real world and what they're like to fight. This week I'll be covering zombies, probably the most iconic horror Halloween kind of monster. Before I get started though, if you enjoy the content that I make on this channel, in particular if you enjoy this video, make sure to leave it a thumbs up, maybe favourite it, and share it with someone who you think might enjoy it. We've only just been raised from the dead ourselves, we're a very very new channel, so anything you can do like that really helps us out. Anyway, on to the video. So what are zombies? They are the living dead. But in D&D in specific, they are mindless servants of a creature or an object that's raised them from the dead. They were once living and they have been risen. They are servants intrinsically. They're more like a golem, a mechanism of flesh than a thinking kind of creature. And they've been a staple of D&D since the very start. First level adventurers of all shapes, sizes, creeds and backgrounds have no doubt fought some zombies in one capacity or another. They don't have minds or souls, slowly rot. They've been possessed of just enough necromantic magic to keep them operating and moving, following orders. They understand languages that they knew in life, can understand their master. But otherwise, they're not going to be talkative dinner guests. They're not going to really help you out with much unless you tell them to specifically carry out a physical task. Just about anything can be a zombie. In the Monster Manual, we've got rules for Beholder zombies, Ogre zombies, and just your regular humanoid zombie. But just about anything can be a zombie, so I'm going to be drawing a zombie elf today, I think. Haven't seen that too much. Now, important zombie topic is whether or not we're having to deal with speed zombies, the kind of ones that sprint after you, a bit like those who have the virus in 28 Days Later. Or are we talking about proper, traditional, shambling, walking, slow zombies? Well, in D&D, um, we have specifically slow zombies. They don't have a very rudimentary understanding of what's going on around them. They are just animated by magic. They're just vessels for necromantic magic, so they don't do a whole lot of thinking. They move super slow. They only move at 20 feet, so you can easily outrun them with your 30 feet. Unless you're a halfling, you might have a little bit of trouble if they start dashing. But on the upside, because they have such a basic rudimentary understanding of what's going on, they will always follow a straight line towards whatever they're supposed to be attacking. Which means if you put any obstacles in front of them, any traps, dig a hole, wander up some stairs, things like that, they are bound to fall into those traps, fall over those obstacles, walk straight into whatever problem you put in their path. They're not a smart enemy. They basically just won't use the decaying, rotting brain that is inside that head of th They have absolutely no vestige of their former personality, which can lead to some fantastic torment if someone has decided to become a necromancer to raise a lost loved one or something similarly traumatizing as that. They'll find of their loved one returned to them, slowly rotting, but with no personality whatsoever, the brain literally does does not function at all. It's basically like summoning a servant or a familiar that happens to just be living inside some dead material. And I think it's safe to say that with this lack of ability to use their brains, you know, only a certain amount of magic can be pumped into a zombie to make it operate, there's clearly not enough to keep the dead tissue from healing or regenerating to keep it alive. So gradually it'll start to rot and decay. No matter how fresh the corpse is, it'll decay at a natural rate, which is why we get such beautiful examples as the zombies in The Walking Dead, that kind of stuff. That's what we got to keep in our heads as we think about zombies in D&D. Now I've kind of undersold zombies here. I feel sorry for the necromancers among you that are watching this while I slate your creations, but the undead have some marvelous properties about them. The main one being their undead fortitude. This is their greatest strength. Now zombies don't have a huge amount of hit points. They're just challenge rating one quarter, so you can find them very early on in the campaign. They've got an armor class of eight, sorry for spoilers. I suppose if they were wearing armor or something like that in life, maybe it would be a little bit more difficult than that. But they're very slow, they're very easy to hit. It seems like they're a shoe-in to just die immediately, right? But if damage reduces a zombie to zero hit points, I'm reading here, you must make a constitution saving throw with a difficulty of five plus the damage taken. Unless the damage is radiant or from a critical hit on a success, the zombie drops to one hit point instead. On top of that, zombies are completely immune to poison damage because it doesn't matter what's coursing through their veins. So, what that means for zombies is that unless you're using radiant damage or unless you crit these things, there is a chance that no matter what you do to them, they will keep coming after you. Because that's not a once a day ability, that's not once per attack, that's not once per encounter, that's not once per round. Every time, damage should reduce them to zero they get to make that constitution saving throw. So really what you gotta do is get some kind of attack that deals an enormous amount of damage to increase that difficulty rating to make it impossible for them to come back up. But otherwise, if you're a low-level adventurer and you're fighting these guys, you have normal weapons doing D6 or D4 damage, it's extremely likely that a zombie will come back. 
So if you are a necromancer and you've invested in your very own zombie, you have a near indestructible creature, certainly at low levels, that will do your rudimentary bidding at the very least. Now that does make them sound pretty damn tough, but the thing you don't have to worry about with zombies is infection. Now we all know the kind of trope that if a zombie bites you, then give it time and you'll come back as one of the Walking Dead yourself. Or in fact, in the comics and the TV show of The Walking Dead, you don't even need to be bit. It's just in the air. Whatever's happened to the world has infected everybody. But in D&D, corpses are risen specifically through magical means. They have to be cast through a spell, a vessel for magic. They're not a virus, they're not a curse. So if you get bitten, you're just bitten. In fact, the main attack of a zombie is slam. Basically a punch, uh, you know, it throwing itself into you. It's just a 1d6 plus 1 damage attack. It's close combat. I mean, it has a range of 5 feet, but it's close enough combat. And zombies can use weapons if they have them in their hands or if they're tied to them, but they're not intelligent enough to pick up a weapon unless commanded. They may not even be dexterous enough to pick up a weapon. They're just going to hammer their fists at you, basically. But let's say you do get bitten. What happens then? Like I said, in D&D, nothing. Absolutely nothing. It could be really interesting to put infectious zombies into your D&D game, make a proper zombie apocalypse. How would that come about when zombies are magical? Well, it could be that the wizard or the object that is raising the dead near it could have been destroyed, could die, or could be cursed midway through casting this spell to raise an awful lot of dead. That could influence the spell somehow, pass on whatever curse was being thrown at the necromancer into the spell that he's casting, entwining the magic, causing zombies to become infectious. At which point I would probably increase their difficulty rating just a little bit. Maybe give them the same difficulty rating as a werewolf's bite and see what happens. But that is going to be a seriously terrifying campaign. I've never actually played a zombie apocalypse in D&D. I've fought zombies before. I've for necromancers, I've seen super weapons of legions of corpses waiting underground to be resurrected by a very powerful lich, but I've never seen an infectious zombie attack in D&D. If you've ever been in one of those, or you've, you've made your players face infectious zombies, uh, make sure to write about it in the comments. I would love to see how that worked for you, uh, if your players enjoyed it, if you found it too tough or too easy, because I'm itching to try that out. I just really want to see if... Uh, if it... But where does the word zombie come from? Where does this idea of zombies come from? Well, we know that the English language uh, didn't really have zombie as a word until 1819. Um, and that referred to, well, when people in England understood it, to uh, an Afro-Brazilian rebel leader uh, called Zumbi, Z-U-M-B-I. I say rebel. Uh, he was a resistance leader uh, fighting against slavery. So, you know, it seems kind of dumb to have him as an enemy in our minds now. He was obviously very feared back then, being a rebel. But Zumbi, this guy's name, um, actually has ties to West African words that mean things akin to God or a fetish, something magical. So it seems like maybe he was revered for being divine and inspirational, magical, unlikely in some capacity. But zombies have pretty much always been popular in Haitian tradition, not to be confused with the practice of witch doctors of voodoo. There are separate people um, called Bokor, I think that's how you pronounce it, Bokor, B-O-K-O-R, anyway, who are basically sorcerers, and they would use magical practices to control someone in life or in death. The people that they would control would be known as zombies, under the command of this sorcerer. In this Haitian tradition, zombies can either be flesh or spirits, interestingly. They can be, you know, zombies as we know them, or they can be spirits, ghosts. Um, but they can't be both. The idea is that this practice, much like a horcrux in Harry Potter, kind of separates soul from body, and the Bokor gets to choose which they can, which they control, which they command. Now, interestingly, something that I've not seen come up in, in any media, um, again, let me know if you've seen it, but according to this magic, uh, feeding the person salt, feeding the zombie some salt, um, can break this Bokor's hold on, uh, on the zombie, allowing them to return to a normal life. But there's no talk, as far as I can find, um, of these ancestral zombies, or zombies in D&D, actually even eating flesh, let alone being infectious. But the whole eating human flesh thing um, actually originated from George Romero, uh, from the film Night of the Living Dead in 1968. So it's a really recent idea, but it's so intrinsically tied to the idea of a zombie in our heads now, you can't really imagine it without. I certainly like to play with new players who have never fought a zombie in D&D bar, big zombie fans and maybe say, ah, oh, the zombie bites you. Well, the constitution saving throw. There's nothing that happens. They automatically pass. Maybe the constitution saving throw is just to see whether or not they're grossed out by what happened. Maybe they contract a little bit of a disease if a chunk of their flesh is removed from the rotting teeth. They need to go and get some sort of tetanus jab or something. But they're fine. Because of this shared knowledge that a zombie is going to bite you and infect you, 
They start to panic. There's dissent amongst the group. Are they going to execute this player for being bitten? But as I say, um, cannibalistic zombies only existed as a result of George Romero in the 60s. Now, apparently the idea behind this comes from the idea that obviously zombies are able to move. They can hear stuff because they'll move towards things. They can maybe see because they are moving towards people to attack them. Which means there's probably some kind of brain function active, right? Even if it's just the stem. So in this animated state, this sort of semi-alive state, um, we can imagine that whatever part of the brain that's active is right near the hypothalamus. It's got to be right in the very sort of basis part of the brain. And that's stimulating ghrelin production. Ghrelin, however you pronounce it. The hormone that basically makes us hungry. And essentially what that means is that zombies are constantly starving. It's the only part of their brain that's active and therefore the brain's going into hyperdrive in that one particular area. So they have just enough brain function to have motor functions and also to be absolutely starving. So it doesn't matter what you'd put in front of them, they would be hungry for blood. Now I'm obviously drawing an elf zombie here, but is there anything that can't become a zombie in d and I mean, you can even raise them yourself. If you're a necromancer, if you're a wizard of any kind, you learn necromancy, you can raise the dead, you can raise undead servants, you can even raise permanent servants. Hell, even clerics can do it. They choose to not call it necromancy, but they are necromancy spells to resurrect or to reincarnate people. Well, in some interpretations, the elf that I'm drawing should not be. In some versions of storytelling, not editions of D&D, but in some DM's cases, there is a case to be put forward that elves cannot become zombies. In a lot of versions of D&D, elves have something called an immunity to ghoul paralysis. And that's because if a ghoul bit you, so festering and disgusting, that you would either contract some kind of shock or you'd be so repulsed you would forfeit an action, maybe several, just out of the horror of what has just happened to you. This extended to things like zombies, certainly in earlier editions, and elves were deemed to be immune to it. There's been a lot of questions raised as a result of that. Why would that be the case? And there are a few different theories. The first one being that, you know, an undead is so unnatural and horrendous that basically the bite of a ghoul, the bite of a zombie perhaps, would be trying to taint an elf. According to Gary Gygax, elves are so positive, they're so made of such radiant and positive magics and energies, so tied to the Fae, they're almost mythical creatures themselves, that such effects would simply not harm them, change them in any way. They are so purely good. But another alternative way of looking at it is that through Tolkien, elves were seen as wondrous creatures, similar to the way they are described by Gary Gygax in D&D. They're immortal. They're utterly immortal unless they forsake their immortality, and therefore they don't really have a fear over death because they don't know it. They don't know what death is. It's unlikely to happen to them. And so if by bitten by a ghoul, they would simply see that as a strange occurrence, but they wouldn't be horrified, shocked, or infected by it. Kind of open to interpretation. But there's nothing saying that an elf explicitly cannot become a zombie. It's just some DM's preference to say that as a result of this lack of ghoul paralysis, that elves also cannot become corrupted by the undead. But otherwise, zombies are fairly simple creatures. As I mentioned earlier, they are a challenge rating one quarter. What that means for you is that even at level one, you're going to be fighting four of these, which means, generally speaking, you're going to have a party versus a party. The upside is, if you wait until a little bit later in your campaign, to add zombies into the mix. It means you can have your players fighting legions of them, which we know is pretty damn exciting. I really love to turn zombies into more of a kind of a threat, a challenge or a puzzle more than an out and out fight, because it can get kind of dull. They don't do much damage. They're almost certainly gonna live through no matter what attack you throw at them, unless it does an enormous amount of damage. Even if you knock their heads off, you know, they're constructed by magic, it doesn't really matter in this edition. It's not the kind of headshot and they're dead kind of trope that seems to be in a lot of media. You can fight a zombie that's just a pair of legs in D&D. They'll keep coming back up. So I like to have them as a kind of threat. If there's enough of them there, they'll end up doing enough damage per round to be a real threat to your adventuring party. But maybe they have to figure something out in time before zombies will reach them. Or maybe they have to find a way to trap all of the zombies at once. Maybe the ground beneath them is swelling up, filling with thousands of corpses, all of which will do a tiny amount of damage, but cumulatively they will be enormously terrifying and it gives you a chance to use combat as a really interesting really interesting puzzle rather than just making it something that is a stock filler kind of a fetch quest style boring bit of content so i like to use zombies from level one all the way up to the higher levels but in just slightly different ways maybe there's something you actually fight when it's early on but maybe they become something a little bit more distressing later maybe you have to stop them reaching a village maybe you have to make some kind of blockade who knows but we all know and love a zombie that's why they had to be this week's monster monday just in time for halloween 
Halloween. Now, I love drawing zombies, guys, so thank you for sticking around while I indulge myself here. We'll be going back to our regularly scheduled programming next week. Halloween will be over, so it's time to get back to some of the less spooky monsters of D&D. If you have any suggestions of what you'd like to see next, please leave it in the comments below or on any of our social media. We have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff. There, yeah, Links in the description box down below. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave it a little thumbs up. Maybe favorite it and share it with someone who might get a kick out of seeing some elven zombies. Until next time, have a fantastic Halloween, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>